G'day mate, how are you this week? It is so good to have you here for another episode of the Exponential Performance Podcast. In this episode, I'm taking a look at some questions and comments that I got about the Strength Training for Endurance Performance Podcast last week and just expanding a little bit deeper, investigating a few different angles to help you maximize your performance. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Exponential Performance Podcast. Join sports scientist and performance coach Maddie Graham to find out how to train smarter and maximize your performance no matter who you are. G'day, mate. It is so good to have you here for another episode of the Exponential Performance Podcast. Episode number 15, to be exact. Episode 15. Before we crack into it, I just want to give you a little bit of an insight into something really cool that I have used to great success in the past. It's cold here at the moment. It is cold, and I've got a lot of stuff going on. We're in the process of building a new house. We're pretty snowed under at work at the moment, coaching, uh, training athletes in the gym as part of my strength and conditioning role. It's all cracking along at a great speed. And what I've used in the past is something called the 100-day challenge. The 100-day challenge is, it's not magic. All it is, is it's a really awesome system that helps you set goals and then work towards them step by step. I've used it in the past to tackle some really big goals such as renovating and selling our house in Dunedin and moving to Wanaka to live. When I rode the length of New Zealand in the unsupported 3,000 kilometre tour of Aotearoa, getting my master's research published in a scientific journal and expanding my reach of the, my exponential performance coaching business. So I've used it in the past to tick off a lot of big goals. I know it works. And at the moment, I'm a little bit stuck, and whenever I get stuck, I always come back to the 100-day challenge as a wee little bit of a revitalizer. And what always happens is it's I just start to build momentum. And every day when I check in with the 100-day challenge and they have a daily video and daily things to focus on and key things to attack that ball just starts rolling faster and faster and faster. And before you know it, you're six months down the track and you look back at everything you've achieved and it's awesome. And to be honest, I wasn't going to share that with you today, but personally, I'm a little bit stuck at the moment. I'm going to sign up again for the 100 day challenge and get stuck into it to see if I can break through and achieve some of my bigger goals so if you want to join me check out the link that i've posted over at the exponential performance coaching website under episode 15 of the podcast down in the show notes and you can join me on the 100 day challenge and see what you see what you can achieve this year so Without further ado, let's get into the show for today where I am taking a look at some questions and comments I got about last week's Strength Training for Endurance Athletes podcast. Here we go. So the first question or the first sort of feedback I had about the strength podcast I did last week was this one. It said yoga and Pilates will help you with strength, core and flexibility. On the bike, I do my strength training by riding in the big dog, in the big dog. That's putting it into the big gear, the biggest gear you've got and grinding it out while not losing much form. Person goes on to say, I do this once or twice a week in my 15 minute ride to work. By increasing strength, I find I have a pseudo fitness in that because I don't have to use full strength, I can cycle longer. Another good podcast, thank you. So, yeah, that's an interesting one. Yoga and Pilates will definitely 
increase your strength in terms of those indirect strength gains I talked about last week. Remember those indirect strength gains are all about developing those postural muscles, developing that core, that stability, and starting to get into some of that work that's going to help you be a little more injury resilient. Now yoga obviously has a lot of other benefits as well. And if you enjoy yoga, enjoy Pilates, I'd say get stuck into it big time. Just get stuck into it. I'd rather have an athlete go do yoga, do, go do Pilates than um, not go and do something else. You know, So if, if you're doing that and you enjoy it, by all means, go go and get it. The key thing you need to be aware of is that if you're doing this in a class setting or a group setting, you may not have adequate progression or adequate strength focus. It may be more of a flexibility slash zenning out type of yoga focus, which is fine, but if you're after strength gains, it's obviously not ideal. Yoga and Pilates are going to have sort of a ceiling limit in terms of strength development for endurance performance. And we're going to not get those direct strength improvements that we talked about. So that development of neuromuscular activity in the muscle leading to greater force production, greater power output. So the way this person has overcome that is by chucking her in the big dog and getting stuck into it, putting it in big gear efforts. Now, big gear efforts, for sure, like 100%, you should be doing some sort of strength endurance work on the bike or running at different times of your training. But this should not be a substitute for gym-based training if you're looking for those direct performance improvements. And the reason why I say this is because, yes, you are doing a strength effort or a strength endurance effort, but remember, if you think back to last week's podcast, and if you haven't checked that out, this might be going over your head a little bit, so make sure you go back and listen to that. The strength adaptations that were helping improve endurance performance were coming from four repetition max squats. So that's as much weight as you could lift for four reps, and that's quite heavy. When you think about doing them, doing a big gear effort on the bike, that may be, you know, upwards of, I don't know how long they are. The person didn't say, but you know, one to ten to fifteen minutes. When you're thinking about that, that load, each repetition or each pedal stroke is very, very low. It's like doing body weight squats and not over a full range of movement either. So compared to the strength training that the research has shown to be effective at improving endurance performance, doing big gear efforts on the bikes or you know doing overstride stuff, running hills, you're not getting the same exposure to the strength adaptations that you need to be to get those gains. I would highly recommend doing big gear work, you know, not if you're young, um, not if you've got dodgy knees, but other than that, doing big gear strength-based work is something that I prescribe for my athletes all the time, and it's very effective, but it should not replace the strength gym-based work for strength gains if that is what you're after. If you're not after those direct strength gains, then that's fine. But if you are after them, you need to get into the gym and push those big weights. So I hope that makes some clarification around that. The next question I got was around upper body and direct exercises. So I talked about those direct performance and gains, and I gave some examples of how to get these in the lower body for cyclists and for runners. And I failed to mention any upper body exercises or how you would use the upper body to do those heavy uh, exercises and also the plyometrics. So this person was just asking for some examples around upper body exercises to use. When it comes to the upper body, you can use any exercises really, any push, any pull. 
So I like to break it down to have a pulling exercise and a pushing exercise in the horizontal plane. So that could be a bench press, whether that be with a bar or with dumbbells. And then also some sort of horizontal pulling exercise. So that could be a bench pull, that could be a bent over row, that could be a cable row or a seated row. All of those things are gonna gonna work. And again, you want to target around about that four repetition max. So relatively heavy, a weight that you could lift for four, maybe five reps at a push. So that's our horizontal pushing and pulling. And then we go vertically pushing and pulling. So a vertical pull, a classic one of pull-ups or chin-ups, whatever you want to call them. Alternating that hand grip, whether it be underhand grip, neutral hand grip, overhand grip. There's no right or wrong. I just recommend doing them. Do something is better than nothing. So many people nitpick over little details. But the other people that aren't actually doing anything, you know, while someone's out there punching out neutral grip pull-ups and they're getting criticized for their neutral grip by people that aren't even doing any pull-ups of any sort. So just get out there and do it. If you're at the point where you're so focused on different hand grips to change different muscle activation, then you're probably at the point where you know what to do anyway. And then a vertical push, so that's something that you're picking a weight up, pushing it overhead, whether that be like a military press with a barbell, whether that be uh, a dumbbell shoulder press, whatever it is, just pushing something up overhead. Often that overhead movement is missed with endurance athletes. They do a lot of pulling, a lot of pushing, but not much overhead work. So often that is quite limited overhead, depending on what your sport is. It will depend on whether or not you need to dig into that too much. So plyometric work. How do you do plyometrics for the upper body? Well, classics are kind of, you know, your clap push-ups. So pushing up, exploding up off the ground and clapping your hands in between them. If you can't do that without falling flat on your face, you might want to start on with your hands on a bench, like a like a bench press bench. So you push up, you don't have as much gravity to overcome because you're on that on that lean. Also, you can do the same thing with pull ups if you're quite advanced, pulling up, exploding up so your hands come off the bar at the top and giving yourself a wee clap. The other things you can use are bands and cables to do explosive work with, decreasing the weight but focusing on moving fast. Mid ball throws, mid ball twists, all those things are going to help to develop that explosive nature of your upper body. Also, another thing you can do is over speed work. So, using bands to help you move faster. So, a really good one for this is for pull ups. Even if you can do pull-ups, because often bands are used to help assist pull-ups if you can't lift your whole body weight. If you have a band around your knees and you're doing pull-ups and it's helping you come up, what it's doing is it's making you move faster so your muscles have to contract at a faster rate to keep up with that speed. So if you're a swimmer or a kayaker, then... This over speed work is going to help develop that explosiveness and that speed of that upper body as well. So hopefully those few exercises and tips will help you with that upper body development depending on what your sport is. So the key thing to remember is just like with the lower body, pick a heavy weight and go low reps. And then with your plyometric work, you want a low rate, sorry, a low weight and you want to be moving fast. You want to be moving fast to develop that explosiveness. And that, again, transfers over into endurance, even though it's very counterintuitive to be doing heavy weight work and then also explosive work. But it all comes back to that neuromuscular activation of the muscles. So I've got another comment or a question or whatever you want to call it about home-based training. Home-based training. So... Rather than having to go to the gym, and I realize that some people don't like gyms for whatever reason, there's a multitude of them, they'd rather be out there doing it, or they'd rather be at home because they don't want to go and look at all the poses at the gym. So if you want to train at home, that is fine. 
What I generally recommend is that home-based training is great for those who are looking for the indirect performance gains, the indirect performance gains. But I think if you want to go after those direct performance gains, the gym is the best place to do those because one, it has all of the equipment for heavy lifting, the barbells, all of the weights, the squat racks. Unless you are wanting to fork out a lot of money or you have a very well-equipped home gym, it's quite hard to do those exercises and those lifting sets and reps in a home-based gym just because, one, you might not have the weight to push a 4RM or you don't have a squat rack to get the bar onto your back or into a front squat. So it's a bit, it's just a little bit more complicated doing that stuff at home. So definitely to get started, get some indirect performance gains, get yourself set up at home. And it's pretty inexpensive to get yourself set up at home with a relatively good setup. The first thing I'd suggest is to make yourself a homemade suspension trainer. So I'm not too sure if you've heard of the TRX suspension trainer. Pretty much all it is is some straps, a couple of handles. You tie it off to a rafter, a pole outside, slide it in your door, whatever it is. And pretty much it becomes a, a total gym just off these these webbing straps and, and handles. I think TRX stands for Total Body Resistance Exercise with an X or something like that. But you can make these very easily just out of some rope and a little bit of plumbing pipe for some handles or you could use webbing straps instead of rope I actually made a video about how I made my suspension trainer um, that I use at home and you can see that I'll post a link over to the video uh, at the show notes over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com under episode 15 of the podcast and it was yeah super easy I'm not too sure how much that thing cost me, but it was less than 10 bucks. Easy, less than 10 bucks. So we've got a suspension trainer. That there is going to tick so many boxes. If you want to step things up a little bit more, you can obviously get a barbell set. If you head down to you know the warehouse or whatever local place you've got, you can get a pretty good barbell set, kind of like the pump ones they use in group fitness classes that have got a small bar and they've got a good you know, set a weight in there as well. It's a really good place to start. It's not going to have enough weight to do your 4RM squats, but like I said, you're probably better off getting to the gym to do those. Other things that are key for a home-based strength training setup, if you're going to get it, are some resistance bands or some bigger monster bands that you can tie off and use for all sorts of things. And no home-based strength setup would be complete without a swiss ball and it's, again a swiss ball there's so many different applications to get those indirect strength improvements when we're talking about core development and postural you know strengthening on top of that you've obviously got your body weight you can do so much with your body weight if you're quite handy chuck up a pull-up bar or you can get one of the ones that rack in the door you got pull-ups to do you got push-ups you got planks you got all sorts of stuff you can do with your body weight. So there's not really any excuse for people not going after those indirect strength improvements at home. But like I said, if you are serious about getting those direct strength improvements, I would highly recommend get to the gym. One, because the equipment's all there. And two, there's someone to look over you in terms of the gym staff to make sure that you're doing everything right so that you don't actually make yourself worse by doing something stupid. So there you have it. That would be my recommendation for a home gym setup. And remember, I'll post that video over at the show notes about my homemade sus- suspension trainer. This next question was around the direct and indirect benefits that I described in the last podcast. And they were asking that, Do you still get these indirect benefits when you're doing the direct strength work or do you need to keep up the indirect type of training to keep getting those benefits? So 
when you have progressed through those low level indirect strength improvement gains and into the heavier direct training methods you're still going to be getting those indirect gains even though you're doing your direct training your direct strength improvements for what of a better word i have simply segregated them into indirect and direct just for ease of understanding so that people can grasp this concept that strength training can improve endurance performance in two completely different ways. So you're still going to be able to get core you know, development and postural improvements when you're lifting heavy. And for argument's sake, you could be getting better gains when you're doing that heavy work just because you have to recruit so much you know, have to recruit every single fiber of your being to push out heavy weighted squats, heavy weighted deadlifts. So yes, you are going to be getting them. There's going to be that core stability. The other one that's really crucial is tendon strength. Lifting heavy weights improves tendon strength, okay? So for endurance athletes who often have a raft of tendon problems, getting in the gym for a, a block of heavy strength work is extremely beneficial to protect you against tendonitis or tendinopathies um, further down the line as you crank up your training volume and start to break everything down again. And the other thing is bone density. If you're a cyclist or a swimmer, you don't get the same bone loading as, say, a runner does. And what this leads to is a decrease in bone density. So while that might not be a problem now, Further down the track as you age, you will open your risk up for getting fractures and diseases such as osteoporosis. So strength training has been shown to really nail this. Okay, It really, really helps improve your bone density for those athletes in non-weight-bearing sports. So if you're a swimmer or a cyclist, uh, or potentially even a kayaker, so you're not getting much mechanical loading. Getting into some strength work during the off season is is really key on so many different levels. And I guess on another note, there's not many sports out there that being strong doesn't have a benefit in some sort of a way, whether that's indirectly or directly. Being strong usually always has some sort of a benefit whether that be an improving your injury resilience so you can train harder or actually improving your power output so you actually go faster on the day being strong definitely has its advantages the final question or comment that i had was about feeling the burn and this person was saying that when they do low repetition strength work like I have described around about that four repetition max they don't feel like they're doing anything because they don't get that burn and they like that burn when they chuck a medium weight on the bar and they start squatting and they're up around 15 to 20 squats they like that burning feeling in their legs it makes them feel like they're doing something well that burning feeling in your legs what it is is just a buildup of hydrogen ions in the body from the anaerobic energy production. So it's just a increased acidity of the muscle. It's not actually going to make you strong. It's not going to make you strong. It's just an increase in those metabolites. It's actually associated as well with muscle breakdown and then also building the muscle up. Every time you break a muscle down, it's stimulated to build back up bigger for next time. So that's traditional hypertrophy training, so building muscle fibers. It's this type of work that bodybuilders will naturally do. If you are feeling that burn, you're not doing your strength training at a low enough reps or high enough weight. When you're doing a 4RM, 4 repetition max, it should it's hard, but you should finish, and you shouldn't be feeling that deep 
burning sensation as if you were doing high repetition max. So I guess the story at the end of the day is if you want to avoid bulking up and you want to actually get the gains that have been shown in the research to improve endurance performance, you really want to avoid that burn sensation when you're training in the gym. Trying to avoid it, and if you are avoiding it, you should be lifting low enough reps and heavy enough to be getting those direct performance improvements. And secondly, you'll avoid bulking up because you're not causing enough muscle damage to stimulate the hypertrophy cycle. So I hope that helps clear up some of the questions, misconceptions, comments around the podcast last week. I had a lot of feedback about it, so thank you very much for your engagement. I hope some of you can get out there and utilize the the training that I've described to help improve your performance. If you're still a little bit confused around what to do and when to do it, I'd highly recommend checking out the Ride Strong program that's designed specifically for cyclists and mountain bikers to improve their performance, both indirectly and directly. This package has everything you need to know in it, training plans, exercise descriptions, the periodization of it all. And then also, if you're a kayaker or a paddle sport athlete, check out Paddle Strong, which again is a strength training program developed specifically for kayakers to target both the indirect and the direct performance improvements if you just want somewhere to start at a low cost option check out the performance temple function handbook in there is a specific program that i have made that is just really good for beginners it's nice and simple it'll get you started it'll get you tracking towards those indirect performance gains which are a a really good thing at the end of the day to go after if you found this podcast helpful please share it around on social media whether it be on facebook or instagram leave me a comment below tell me what you enjoyed what was the key thing you learned from this podcast if you've got any questions as normal send me a voice message over at the Exponential Performance Coaching website and I will do my best to answer it for you. Or flick me an email, leave me a question in the comments section below. Give me a thumbs up, give me a like, share it around. I want to keep making this podcast as best as I possibly can to keep helping you train hard, but most importantly, train smart so that you can achieve your goals. I'll talk to you next week.